You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Hello and welcome to our second edition of This Week in Space, powered by Space Flight Now. I'm Miles O'Brien. And as the flying nun would say, you like us, you like us. We are feeling the love here at Twist after our premiere show in the waning day of the aughts. We ought to share some of the laurels and a few darts with you. We shall, once we get into orbit. So for now, let's light the candle. Of course, that is what the space world is hoping the Obama administration will do by the end of this month. Light the candle on NASA's next chapter in piloted space exploration. Now, if someone tells you they know what the White House is going to do, they're probably lying. Unless that someone happens to be the president, the president's science advisor, or NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. We do know this. The president will deliver his State of the Union address and then roll out his budget by the first week in February. Surely we will know something concrete by then. Safe to say Obama is going to sanction more international partnerships in space, a greater role for the private sector to build rockets, and a mandate that NASA push the exploration envelope. So where does that leave your favorite space vehicle? Well, if it happens to be the shuttle headed for the Smithsonian, don't hold your breath for a reprieve for the orbiters. If you're a fan of the Constellation Plan, Ares 1, a trip back to the moon, you have some friends in Congress. Late last year, Alabama Senator Richard Shelby engineered a rules change that requires congressional approval of any big change to human exploration plans. As Keith Jackson might say, whoa, Nellie, we have a Donnybrook here. So stay tuned. It will be a sad, nostalgic year for the space shuttle team. Every milestone toward launch will also be one more step toward the end of an era. Take this site, for example. That's the shuttle Endeavour headed out to launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center last week. She's currently undergoing final preps for launch on a mission to deliver and install Tranquility, the third and final node of the space station. But all is not tranquil for this station component. The ammonia lines that connect Tranquility to the station cooling system failed a pressurization test. Apparently, it's a fundamental design flaw. One team is working on a redesign that will be sent up to the station later. But for now, engineers are welding together some shorter hoses in an effort to jury rig a fix. Launch is targeted for February 7th, but don't write that one in pen. In the meantime, crews moved the big external fuel tank that will power Discovery into orbit in March into the vehicle assembly building, where it will be mated with the solid rocket boosters and the orbiter. And Discovery's crew was at the Cape this week for what's called the Crew Equipment Interface Test. It's the last time they can lay their hands on some flight hardware before they head off on their supply run to the station. The Tranquility node will offer station keepers the best view of Earth from inside the outpost by far. It has a large cupola with a big 80 centimeter, 31 inch porthole surrounded by a half dozen trapezoid windows. Built by the European Space Agency, this room with a view will also serve as a control tower for robot arm operations, and it will have a special plaque somewhere in the mullions. On it, some moon rocks collected by Neil Armstrong on July 20th, 1969, and carried to the top of Mount Everest by former astronaut Scott Parazinski on May 20th, 2009. Now, Parazinski gave the moon rocks with a piece of Everest to Commander George Zamka in Houston on January 6th. Suffice to say, Zamka, they call him Zambo, is an overqualified rock courier. Meanwhile, up on the ISS, NASA's Russian comrades stepped into their Orland spacesuits and ventured outside the pier's airlock for a spacewalk on Thursday. Oleg Kotov and Max Zarayev prepped the new airlock and docking port called Poisk. Poisk means search in Russian, or as we say in English, Google. Poisk will be a parking spot for Soyuz spacecraft that serve as a ferry to and from Earth and a lifeboat if they have a bad day up there. Zarayev and astronaut Jeff Williams plan to try the new port on Versage next week. They will move a Soyuz from the Zvezda service module to Poisk. Don't forget to feed the meter, boys. Meanwhile, deep in the heart of Texas, a big step on the road to sending privately built spacecraft to the space station. Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX, ran a full duration test of the second stage for its Falcon 9 rocket. Looks good to me. Lots of noise, fire and smoke. And the company confirms the motor did pass the test. Now they can start packing it up and shipping it off to Cape Canaveral. 
SpaceX founder Elon Musk says the test launch will happen there one to three months after the motor is delivered. The company has a one and a half billion dollar NASA contract to build a spacecraft that can deliver cargo to the station. Sort of takes the Fed out of FedEx, I suppose. Whether they carry a badge signed by Charlie Bolden or Elon Musk, rocket scientists are genetically hardwired to obsess about the future. And in the course of turning their visions into reality, they often forget the importance of history. Such was the case when they lost those high quality tapes of the Apollo 11 moonwalk. How the heck did that happen? Well, there was almost another historical tragedy involving yet another moon mission, but the day was saved thanks to an unlikely team working in an unlikely place. The old McDonald's at NASA's Ames Research Center in California doesn't have any golden arches. Yet there is gold inside, a pirate's treasure. But mining it is hard. This is what it sounds like when they hit the pay dirt. The date is 29 November 1966. And the spacecraft is the Lunar Orbiter, sent to the moon by NASA as a robotic scout for the Apollo moonwalkers. The first spacecraft to capture a picture like this, Earthrise. We have sub-kilometer resolution on an image taken in 1966 with 240,000 miles away. Keith Cowing is a former space agency scientist who now runs the internet site NASA Watch. He and his matey on this rogue project, NASA contractor Dennis Wingo, had heard about the orphan tapes for years, part of internet lore. And then in 2007, they stumbled on the missing link the old Ampex FR-900 tape drives. They were sitting in a barn owned by retired NASA Nancy Evans, who saved the machines when the Jet Propulsion Lab scrapped them. Dennis hopped on a plane. I'm going, wow, cool, uh, these are tape drives, and found out from Nancy that she was the one that led the effort in the early, early years to do this, but hadn't been able to get it going. But no one at NASA believed it could be done. Keith and Dennis took that as a challenge. They rented some trucks, found the tapes in storage, and then started looking for a place to set up shop. Ames was a Navy base and had plenty of abandoned buildings, including the McDonald's. So they moved in with help from some college students. Austin Epps is studying aerospace engineering at San Jose State University. His father was 10 when Lunar Orbiter took this image. You know, you learn about things that probably nobody's used in decades. It's, it's really cool. But the secret sauce to this project is this man, Ken Zinn, who has 40 years experience working on these machines in military and civilian jobs. Every time you run these machines, the heads have to be adjusted and have to be refurbished. And there's a lot of t tender loving care that goes into it. Keith and Dennis started this project out of pocket, then cobbled together some funding, just shy of a million dollars. NASA had estimated it would cost five million dollars just to build some new machines to play the tapes. I'm kind of glad that I didn't really understand the whole ramifications of uh, what really had to be done or I might not have been as optimistic. So what's next for the McMooners? Well, they would support a new trip to the moon. Quick as you can say, two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Now that's a reference that carbon dates me. For you kids, that was the Mickey D's jingle about 35 years ago, right after you deserve a break today. Both beat I'm loving it hands down, if you ask me. Now space fans the world over will love this if it should come to pass. Remember Mars Phoenix? Could it rise from the ashes, or perhaps more accurately, from a Dr. Zhivago-like glaze of dry ice? NASA last heard from the Phoenix in November of 2008. The craft landed near the Martian North Pole about five months prior, logged a successful mission, and then died at the onset of winter. Or did it? Now that it is spring, one of NASA's orbiters will listen to see if Phoenix is transmitting. Who knows? We may hear yet again from the first spacecraft ever to tweet. Coming up, the Hubble Hugger-in-Chief. Astronaut and astronomer John Grunsfeld broke out his tools and tinkered with the Hubble Space Telescope on not one, not two, but three, count them three, different servicing missions. No one knows Hubble like this guy. Now he's hanging up his spacesuit, but he's not going very far. Stay with us for that. We're back. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Miles O'Brien, and you're watching This Week in Space, powered by Spaceflight Now. 
We got a lot of feedback on our first show, and we thought we'd share some of it with you. For the most part, we had a real outpouring of support, and for that, we thank you. A few examples. Del Boyles emailed this. This is exactly what the space junkie doctor ordered and provides the missing link to important news that is omitted by the existing media. Keep them coming. Freehawk tweeted us, enjoyed episode one, good production, interesting content, and fast pace. May the news be prolific for you in the new year. Amen to that, Freehawk. And Mike Croft typed, I plan to watch on the web every week. Now just get Mr. Obama and the boys in Congress to watch as well, and things may just work out. Hosanna to that one, Mike. We got some constructive ideas that we plan to take to heart. Jason Laguerre emailed, I would love to see an occasional look into the space efforts of countries other than the U.S. It would be interesting to see the gamut of space research and activity around the globe. Well, stay with us for more on that later in the show. And to be fair, you folks sent in a few zingers as well. Mark Brissino emailed this, I have always liked Miles as a reporter, so please do not take offense. Miles should dial down the jokes. Oh, no offense taken, Mark, but we have added your email to our spam catcher. Oh, sorry, that was a joke, too. And then there is my personal favorite, this tweet from Quantum G, who I might add had a number of pointed things to say to us. I have no idea who the blank Miles O'Brien is. To me, that's a name of a character in Star Trek. Well, you are by no means the first to confuse me with Chief O'Brien, Quantum G. And who the bleep are you, anyway? If you're anything like me, you were on the edge of your chair last summer watching the crew of the shuttle Atlantis grind out five marathon spacewalks for a final servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. The Atlantis crew really hit it out of their park, installing some new instruments and resurrecting some old ones that had seemed broken beyond repair. The lead spacewalker was John Grunsfeld on his third Hubble servicing mission. I had the good fortune to do a unique underwater interview with him in the run-up to SDS-125 as he practiced some of his tasks in the pool at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. I even tried my hand with the pistol grip tool. That's NASA speak for a screwdriver. And believe me, they all make it look easy. So now Hubble is turning out great images like this and should be for another decade. But what next, Columbus? What does a Hubble hugger do for a next act? The obvious answer? Go to Hubble headquarters, the Space Science Telescope Institute in Baltimore. Grunsfeld, who has a PhD in physics, is the new deputy director. I caught up with him the other day via Skype and asked him where he and Hubble go from here. John Grunsfeld, thanks for joining us on This Week in Space. Uh, when I last talked to you in person, it was at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. You were practicing for the big Hubble repair mission. You were concerned about a lot of things. Were the things you were concerned about the things that were difficult in orbit, or were there other things? Well, I spent a lot of time worrying about what could go wrong, and you saw that when I was in the water uh, preparing for the advanced camera for surveys repair. We worried so much about all these little things that could go wrong uh, that I think we were very well prepared then when we got to space, and a lot of little things went wrong. When I was doing the advanced camera for surveys repair and had to cut through an aluminum grid, uh, when in space it didn't come off cleanly, I thought, okay, I've done this before, I knew exactly what to do, bend it back and forth like a pull tab, and off it came, and I just continued working. And I think the best example of humans being productive in space is when we couldn't get a handrail off, and Mike Massimino had to rip it off. Uh, that we were able to get the other repairs done. So we worried about a lot, and it went great. We got everything done and a little bit more on Hubble, and Hubble is just working great. Well, tell me a little bit about that. You've had a chance to see some of these great images that have been coming back from the Wide Field Camera 3. Uh, it's got to be great to see that, very satisfying. Do you have a favorite? Well, I just came back from a big astronomy meeting, and there's a, a view that we have from the Wide Field Camera 3 of galaxies going almost back to the beginning of time. They're 13 billion years old galaxies, some of the primordial light galaxies, uh, the first stars and galaxies that formed. But my favorite is still the picture of Jupiter that we took in July of last year because it was the first picture that Hubble took after the service emission and it proved that we didn't break the telescope, that it was all working. Uh, that particular picture has a little smudge on it. Something big hit Jupiter, much like Shoemaker Levy 9 15 years ago. And uh, the smudge is about the size of the Earth. So it's pretty phenomenal. 
For you, you got to be a um, kid in a candy store with this new job at the Space Telescope Science Institute. What are you planning, and, and what are you planning for Hubble over the coming years? Well, I'm, I'm just planning to be able to, to help the team uh, keep Hubble going for many years and transition to the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be the next really amazing observatory uh, in space that's going to help us learn about all these planets we're discovering and look into the very distant universe. I, you know, I think I also have a very strong interest in trying to help kids get excited about science. That's uh, top on my list. Well, good. We, we'd love to help you with that one. It must have been hard to leave Hubble that last time. Actually, you know, I was worried about that. Would I be really moody afterwards? But I was so thrilled to see the telescope heading off with a full suite of brand new instruments as if we'd totally remade Hubble. Uh, for me, even though Hubble's coming up on its 20th uh, birthday on orbit, it's a brand new telescope. It's the Benjamin Button of telescopes, right? Getting younger all the time. Yeah. John Grunsfeld, the Hubble hugger, thanks for your time. My pleasure. If Hubble is Benjamin Button, the Kepler Space Telescope might be called Goldilocks, as it is designed to find the planets that are just right for harboring life as we know it. And the Kepler team has rolled out its first batch of discoveries, five planets in all, none like Earth, but hey, it's a start. The team says they are hot Jupiters, gas giants orbiting very close to their suns. So how hot is it on these planets? Hotter than molten lava or even a New York City subway platform in August. Returning now to our theme of little spacecraft that could, we bring you the amazing seven-year odyssey of Japan's Hayabusa spacecraft, which is Japanese for Peregrine Falcon. Three years late, after a fuel leak and a cascade of failures that should have made it a piece of space junk, Hayabusa is on the home stretch now, bringing some pieces of an asteroid back to Earth. Hopefully, that is. The spacecraft has a novel ion propulsion system, which failed. But the ground team was able to rig up a makeshift way to generate thrust using operative components from both engines. If all goes well, the Falcon should feel the gravitational pull of Earth in June. NASA's Kennedy Space Center can be a pretty wild place, literally. The launch pads sit amid the Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge. All kinds of endangered and rare species live there, and they just got some unexpected company. About 300 loggerhead turtles meandered into a lagoon at the Cape, apparently stunned by the unusually cold water off the Florida coast. Wildlife agents and scientists rescued the turtles, checked them out, and then shipped them to a warm place inland where they will stay until the weather turns for the better. Okay, folks, we saved the best for last. Take a look at what is either a scene from those magnificent men in their flying machines or the David Letterman Show. The place, NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia. The idea, drop a helicopter 35 feet to see what happens. The Army donated bird was brimming with sensors and rigged up with a shock absorber made of honeycombed Kevlar. Four crash test dummies were strapped in, one of which had sensors in the torso that simulated internal organs. Stop it, I said internal organs. The Kevlar cushion was cooked up to protect astronauts in returning spacecraft, but engineers wanted to see if it could be a practical lifesaver for aviation as well. Now, the helicopter hit the ground at just over 53 miles an hour. The dummies said their necks were hurting and they were calling their lawyers. That's our show. Thanks for joining us. I'm Miles O'Brien. If you have thoughts you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at twists at spaceflightnow.com or tweet us at, at This Week in Space. Also, check out our blog at www.milesobrien.com. Next time, how's this for art imitating life? These paintings of the surface of the moon didn't spring from the artist's imagination. He was there. Apollo 12 moonwalker Alan Bean gave me a cook's tour of his recent gallery show at the Smithsonian, no less. All that and more next time on This Week in Space. We'll see you then.